Today's reading in 2 Samuel is a direct continuation of what we heard last week in our reading from 2 Samuel. So if you thought we weren't going to talk about what happens with David, Bathsheba, and Uriah, well, now we are. This is a tough story in Scripture to hear. And that has a great deal to do with one of the main people it's about, David, the great king of Israel, the king of the golden age of Israel. Person through whom the Messiah was to come. And it's also difficult because the story puts that person, puts King David, in not the best of light. Yet this is an important story, an important one for us to hear. And in fact, the Children's Illustrated Bible includes this story. It includes this story when it doesn't include many others. Because the thought was is that this is a key story. You cannot understand anything that comes after it without first understanding the story of David and Bathsheba. Now, in fact, I first encountered this story in the Children's Illustrated Bible when I was very, very little. And the Children's Illustrated Bible doesn't mince any words with it. It gives a pretty clear sense of what happens in this story directly from the Scripture. That's true of many of the stories that the Children's Illustrated Bible presents. But this one, especially for me as a young child, is very difficult to grasp because at that point in time, I didn't really understand a lot about marriage or relationships or cheating as we have here. Now, as a child, I went to the person that I thought might be able to answer my confusion. I went to my mom. And she, in her infinite wisdom, and, and I mean that seriously, decided when I asked her this to say to me, let's go for a walk. Part of this was because we lived very close. To the priest at our church. He was just a couple of uh, doors down from us. And the time of day when I was asking these questions happened to be when he was normally out for a walk. So I thought, well, let's go out, let's see if he's there, and then he can explain his story to Trey, which is exactly what happened. And I wish I could remember exactly how he explained the story of David and Thankfully, for all of you parents and grandparents out there, there's actually an even better resource that has come up in the years after I was growing up. This is thanks to VeggieTales. VeggieTales has given us a much more kid-friendly way of looking at the story of David and Bathsheba in their tale King George and the Duckling. And just to give a little sense of that and to maybe give a little bit of a better sense of what's going on in this story, let's walk through that right now. Now, King George is the stand-in for David, and Uriah, who was Bathsheba's husband, has the stand-in of Thomas in the Veggie Tales. And instead of dealing with wives, we're dealing with rubber duckies. And one day, King George spies a very remarkable rubber ducky that happens to belong to Thomas. 
And even though King George has a whole drawer full, a, a whole uh, wardrobe full, really, of rubber duckies, he decides he wants this one. Now, as in the story from Scripture, there is a war going on in King George and the Ducky, a high war. Again, being more kid friendly. And much like in the scripture, King George, like King David, decides to send Thomas, again, to stand in for Uriah, to the front lines of this war. And he commands that all the troops take a step back away from Thomas so that he will be hit by all the pies coming. Now, whereas Uriah dies, Thomas survives, but is completely psychologically damaged from this experience. And King George looks at that and thinks, okay, well, he can't use his ducky now, so I can take it instead. And then we get much more closely to what we've heard in our reading. Instead of the prophet Nathan, we have the wise man, Melvin, who comes in and gives the exact same story we heard. The story about the rich man with many sheep, who when he needs one of these sheep to feed his guests, instead of using one of his own, takes one of the sheep, the only sheep, that his poor neighbor has. King George, much, much like King David, hears this story and is immediately angry and says, we need to do something. Who was this person? They are going to be punished as strictly as we can. And both Melvin and the prophet Nathan look at King George, King David, and say, you are the man. Now, thankfully, both King George and King David see that they've done something wrong, thanks to this story. And they don't look to their kingly authority. Instead, they both recognize that they've done something wrong. And in fact, David gives us the 51st Psalm, that psalm that we read every year, Ashley said. He gives us that psalm as his own dealing with his sin. Now, with King George and the Ducky, the story ends well. There, King George takes Thomas in and starts to nurse him back to health and tells him what he did, and ask for his forgiveness. The story of King David doesn't end quite as well, because Uriah is dead. He can't ask for Uriah's forgiveness. And then the firstborn of David and Bathsheba dies. And while David learns to live with the grief, that death of a child. He never really recovers from the grief of the knowledge of his own wrongdoing. And that, unfortunately, leads to him not keeping quite a close eye on his family, as he should be. Unfortunately, it leads, as we'll see next week, to some great turmoil in his family. The turmoil that infects the entire kingdom. Now, David and Bathsheba do have a son later on. That son goes by the name of Solomon. Solomon ends up taking the throne after his father David. And Solomon is famous, well known throughout the world, throughout history for being a very wise king. But 
Unfortunately, part of that wisdom leads Solomon to making strategic marriages to the various kingdoms surrounding ancient Israel. And as part of those marriages, Solomon allows for these wives to come in and to bring temples to their own false gods, which eventually leads the Israelites away from the Lord, the one true God. Also with Solomon, his sons can't work together, can't relate to each other. And so they tear the nation of Israel into two, the northern kingdom and the southern kingdom which weakens Israel overall. And this is what leads to the eventual downfall of the ancient kingdom of Israel. Now, every action that leads to this downfall of the kingdom stems from just one thing that David did. The very first thing we hear of in our reading from last week in 2 Samuel. David didn't go out with his troops like he was supposed to. He just stayed at home in his house. And the thing is, this was one of the very things that the prophet Samuel warned the Israelites about when they asked for a king in the first place. He said that the king would send their sons out to war instead. So out of this one action, this one wrongdoing, we see every other sin that David commits coming from this. And we see, too, the downfall of the kingdom. Our actions can have momentous effects. And that's not just on us. That's on all those people around us, too. And we have to remember that. And that is why it is important for us to tell the story of David and Bathsheba. That is why it is important for us to remember it, even though it is a difficult story to hear. Out of David's sin comes the snowfall that leads to the destruction of ancient Israel. It's for this reason, too, that Ephesians calls us to no longer be children tossed to and fro and blown about by every wind of doctrine, by people's trickery, by their craftiness and deceitful scheming. It's why Ephesians calls us to remember where we stand, to use our gifts as God would have us use them, whether as apostles, prophets, evangelists, pastors, or teachers, or really any other role that we might have us to fall down the wrong path. That's what we see those who are speaking to Jesus in our gospel this morning doing. It's what we'll continue to see these same people doing throughout our reading from the gospel according to John for this entire month. They fail 
to see the true nature of Jesus's work. They fail to grasp the point. Nothing good will come out of their failure. Understand what it is that Jesus is there for, what it is that Jesus is there for. are important because they don't just impact us. We need to take the time to stop and think about them. I hope that we can all do that. All take the time to stop and think about our actions each day of our lives. When we inevitably drown in our despair as David did, which we will see in more detail in our reading next week. Instead, we have to turn to the truth that Jesus is trying to tell us about in the gospel. The truth that we cannot do this on our own. But, if we lean on the Lord, as Jesus, again, is trying to tell us, then we will be restored, renewed, forgiven, and fed.